guys, I'm Megan. And I'm Morgan, twins and hosts of Eminem Chat, a monthly podcast that brings together our many commonalities, like motherhood, farm life, fitness, chasing our passions, and of course, girl chat. So it is our goal to create a show that is positive, real, and fun. So let's dive into today's episode. All right, hello everyone. Okay, so I was telling Megan that I uh, received the um, New York Times to my email and there was an article that popped up today that just caught my attention and Megan and I are covering newsletters and different media forums this series and just food for thought talking about different subjects and just diving in and kind of giving our two cents about um, just things that relate to those uh, com- commonalities that we're passionate about. And this one ties in really well with fitness and agriculture, kind of bringing the two together. And it was just a fascinating article that just caught my attention. So we thought we'd cover it today for you on the podcast. Now, this is from, like I said, the New York Times, and it's titled The Morning, How Humans Failed Racehorses. And so, of course, at first, I'm like, how humans failed racehorses and being in agriculture and being around livestock, I was definitely curious to read more about what they were trying to share here. So I'm going to just read a little bit about this article and cover a little bit so you guys have a background, and then we'll dive into our thoughts about it. Um, so it says, uh, today my colleague uh, Joe explains the trouble of racehorsing in the United States. We also cover campus protests and... Um, so sorry, that was just an intro <laughs> to that article, I guess. So anyways, um, it's called Human Error. It says, it was a thrilling finish. A long shot named Mystic Dan held off a late um, charge by Sierra Lino and the Colts from Japan named Forever Young on Saturday to win the 150th running of the Kentucky Derby, America's oldest major continuing sport event bringing to a close a much-needed casualty-free week of thoroughbred racing. It was a welcome conclusion for the multi-billion dollar sport, impaired by frequent racing fatalities, reckless breeding, doggy doping practices, and the old-fashioned greed of veterinarians, trainers, and owners. Last year, 12 horses perished at Churchill Downs in the day surrounding the famous race. It only got worse. Two weeks later, a horse trained by one of the sport's most recognized trainers died at the Pimlico race course. At the historical Saratoga race course in New York, a few months later, another 13 horses died while racing and training at the sport's signature summer meet, including two that seemed poised to win the races before they broke down near the finish line on nationally televised broadcast. Ambulance ra- raced to the track and emergency workers erected privacy screens and behind them vets euthanized the horses with injections all of it put the social acceptability of one of america's oldest sports at risk okay megan there is a lot to unpack there and we can come back to that article here in a little bit but just that's a lot there yeah it's mind-blowing that that many horses um died around the race i mean you wouldn't even want one or two to die but last year 12 of them um around the days surrounding the famous race and then uh a few months later another 13 while racing and training um at a summer meet so that's just telling you that something is going on and it does make you want to keep reading the article and finding out the root of the problem uh and it also just shows how competitive the sport is and how much people are willing to do to compete in the sport or what they're willing to, uh, like, as far as breeds and bloodlines go and as far as uh, genetics, like, what they're willing to use and um, kind of go for when it comes to picking out a horse. But also overtraining, I think, it has a lot to do with that, too. So there's probably a lot of things going on here. Um but it just shows you how eye-opening it is and maybe a big problem there is around this. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, this race is 
like they said in the article, one of the oldest competitions in America. And it's something that is celebrated every year. Um, it's very fancy and prestigious. It's kind of like the the in in club in group, the elite like the <laughs> cool kids kind of elite like you said and so it's not surprising that there's going to be issues surrounding it when money is involved and when it's a a million if not billion dollar industry industry um, and people use it for betting like cost betting um mm-hmm. so gambling. Uh, so it's here, similar to other types of sports in the way that uh, it's competitive, but the only difference is that when you're competing in a like football or if you're competing in soccer or you're competing in other sports, it's you, you're competing yourself, so you're training yourself. And yeah, you might be working with a team, but you and yourself are in charge of your own training versus this you're training a horse and an animal so that's where some of the yeah you can comes. yeah and you could compare it to um like other animal races um, dog races uh competitions as far as like the iditarod in alaska with the dog sled racing too that would be something similar as far as breeding goes um where people look for certain types of breeds to uh whether it be horses or dogs to compete in a race because they want the fast lean strong animals that are going to have stamina to make it through the race um but here is some history about the kentucky derby it says the kentucky derby the most prestigious american horse race established in 1875 um Runs annually on the first Saturday in May, always at Churchill Downs Racetrack in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, runs in mid-May, and that's the pre-stakes, and then uh, the Belmont Stakes is early in June. It makes up American Thoroughbred Racing and Triple Crown. The Derby uh, field is limited to three-year-olds, so three-year-old horses. And since 1975, um, 20 horses about 121 fillies. Fillies carry 121 pounds and colds 126 pounds. Um, the race distance was reduced in 1896 from 1.5 miles to 1.25 miles. And in the earliest 21st century, it was one of the most popular single-day specta- spectator events in the world, attracting some 150,000-ish spectators um, annually. So even just thinking about how far that is, like 1.25 miles doesn't sound like very long, but when you're running, so these thoroughbred horses, so it's mainly, so um, I, it's kind of funny that we're talking about breeds because I don't know a whole lot about horses and my sixth graders this year did all of, we, the whole sixth grade unit was all about livestock. And so I had to do my own research about horses because I wasn't as familiar with the breeds and the characteristics. And so thoroughbred was one that um, the class learned about. And a thoroughbred is a horse breed that was developed specifically for horse rating, horse racing. Although the word thoroughbred is sometimes used to refer to any breed of a purebred horse, it technically refers only to the thoroughbred breed, which is a... Um, cross between let me see it was on here one second um it's a cross between stallions of arabian barb and Turkoman breeding so those are the three stallions that it came from um arabian barb and Turkoman. i don't know if i'm saying that Turkoman right but um those three horses all the modern thought can trace their pedigrees to the three stallions that were originally imported from England in the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, and thoroughbreds were specifically bred for the speed, so they can run up to 35 miles per hour. And they're definitely like athletes. Thoroughbreds are made to run. They are made to compete. They have Kind of that it says on here that they're kind of hot blooded, so they're known for their spirit and they want to listen to those directions. Um, there was another horse like the 
Um, wild Mustang is actually a faster breed of horses is what I was finding in my research. And Mustangs can actually go up to about 55 miles per hour. But Mustangs aren't as trainable. They're not as domesticated. The and wild. <laughs> the wild, yeah, the wild Mustang. And Thoroughbred, on the other hand, was bred for domestication. So they have that pleasing mentality. They have that wanting to compete, kind of having that job, kind of like a, a dog. So who, a dog. Or... Yeah, who has a job and a task to do. So they are actually the fastest horses, but they are trainable fast horses. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, what's kind of cool is you mentioned that you had some students looking into this and doing some research on uh, thoroughbreds. I have a student in my class who uh, bay wall races, and uh, she, anytime she can talk about horses, she does. And she presented a slideshow on some different horses that she has learned about and like race horses and um, kind of where they came from the stallions that they came from or like what their bloodline was like, what they were bred for when they were born, how old they lived, what did they die of? Like she went all into it and it was like, what do I listen to her? Because she's definitely passionate about it. Um, But when we go back to the article about the root of the problem with this, because we know that people don't want the horses to die. We know that um, people care about the horses. This is the like some of the livelihood this is the family sport that they participate in um it's also like morgan's at a big industry so they don't want it to look bad they want people to have a good light on horse racing not a negative light so diving into the problem a little bit more it says why do race horses die and as beautiful as a thoroughbred is in full light the legs that seemingly rarely touch the ground so you know when you watch them it seems like they're just kind of gliding it says they're actually pretty fragile. Ankle is the size of like a Coke bottle and hooves the size of a crystal um, ashtray propel a 1,200 pound thoroughbred at speeds up to 35 miles per hour. So the ankles are as big around over the years as they've been bred. Um, over the past 12 months, my colleagues, Melissa Hoppert and I analyzed confidential documents and confirmed recordings made by law enforcement authorities to report on why so many horses supposedly in peak physical condition were breaking down. As is so often the case, money is the root of the problem. Trainers push horses too hard, sometimes giving them illegal performances, enhancing drugs. That's because owners know that the signature win will turn the million-dollar investment into a multi-million-dollar ATM in the breeding shed. It says, do the math. Mystique Dan can be retired tomorrow and enter a life where um, he pretty much can just relax and <laughs> hang out with people. I hang out with other animals. It says mate. That's mate twice a day is what it says, to be honest with you guys. This is New York Times. <laughs> Potentially owning $31 million annually over a breeding career that can last 10 years or more. So, The horse itself is a multi-million dollar horse. So trainers are going to push them harder than they should. And they need to know, trainers need to know when the limit is. And also, just like athletes, they sometimes do illegal things like giving them illegal drugs. Athletes have been caught for doing steroids. Athletes have been caught for doing other things that are illegal. And unfortunately, with any industry, you have bad apples that are also doing it. Yeah, so it says down here, in short, humans have failed the horses. And like you said, Megan, there's bad apples in every bunch. And um, it says most people involved in the sport have put their horses first and are very um, integral in creating the horse racing integrity and safety authority. And just like in every industry and every um, competition, there's people who want to be good sports and play by the rules and those people who want to try to skate by the rules. And but when you do this, then you're they are putting a bad light on the industry because specifically since you are using animals in this competition, it's very important that you show that you're taking animal welfare into um, priority because it's not like the animals aren't 
the hosts they can't are, advocate for themselves. Yeah, they can't advocate for themselves and say that they're exhausted and being overtrained and stuff like that. And so the the competitor, the human, has to make sure that they are watching for cues from the horses, make sure that they are um, cooling them down after practice, making sure that they are taking care of their um, the ankle coats muscles. and it sounds like the muscle issues. Yeah. And also, it's kind of interesting when we talk about genetics, how it can trace back to three stallions that were um, the main lines for the thoroughbred. That also shows it's kind of similar to purebred dogs that sometimes the lines get so narrow and are so purebred that they can have these amazing traits like speed, agility, um, endurance. Beautiful coats. Beautiful coats. But then they also break down in other areas because when we have genetics, you have dominant and recessive traits. And sometimes those recessive traits that you might not be choosing and selecting for can appear like maybe the more fragile ankles or they're not as sound on their feet. So then you also worry about the genetics of the horses and you want to make sure that you are um, trying to balance out those amazing characteristics for the speed of the horses with the longevity of that breed and the sturdiness and soundness that they have strong bones and joints because that's ultimately what's carrying the body, the horses forward. I think so too. I think it's um, all of that plays a role. And um, for those of you who are around horses a lot, like Morgan mentioned, uh, we all see dogs. We all are familiar with dogs and um, same kind of thing happens with dogs. There's, um, a lot of purebreds who have allergy problems or have um, intestinal issues as they get older or don't live as long. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to like get a purebred dog, but you just also have to know the genetics a little bit more. You have to be a little bit more careful, make sure we're not overbreeding um, and getting a, a little bit more of a variety in the genetics too. Um, and also we don't want to lose other genetics. I think it's important to also maintain mm -hmm. uh, like a diversity being to, yeah being able to select and choose genetics is is a cool science thing that we got and do nowadays but also being aware that we don't want to get rid of some genetics and make it too narrow so one thing that I wanted to touch on with this topic is the connection to agriculture so when I first saw that headlight headline um I was concerned about the connection to agriculture. So it says how humans failed racehorses. So a lot of times um, agriculture gets grouped in with like showing and competitions and races. And yes, they are both involving livestock. Yes, they are both involving animals, but they are also completely different. And I'm concerned of how like this sort of article like if PETA was able to get a hold of it or something like that like how that would be portrayed to the media um because this is a few bad apples in a bunch and farmers and others who are racing horses or like your student in your class who bail races like you can tell the passion that she has and the love that she has for horses and so I I want to make it like clear that this is a specific situation An extreme. it's um yep it's extreme there's it's a million billion dollar industry there's a lot of politics that play a role in this um and this is definitely a problem but it's not the majority of the united states and those who have horses and those who compete with them i was gonna look to see if i could see a stat of like how many horses? Well, didn't you see, didn't you read in the beginning of that article that there was like 20 racers in the race? So it was 20 in the race, but it says there was more than four. Well, this was 1990, so this was a long time ago. But this is another New York Times from uh, 1990. Interesting. It says in 1990, there was 44,000 race horses um, in the jockey club. Hmm. I wonder what that number is now. I might look it up. It 
So I'm assuming the the jockey club would be like people who are in elite race horses. In 2022, it was close, 45,840. And they participate in 36,300 races. So if you think about that, you guys, 45,840 just in the jockey club of horse racing. So the people who compete competitively, that's a lot of horses. And there was 12 around the Kentucky Derby that died. So 12 out of 45,840 which we still don't want 12 to die, but that just shows you that it's a small percentage of people who are overtraining, who are not necessarily taking the best care of their animals, whereas all of those other horses are still racing, are still out there, are still hopefully being well taken care of. And that's not even counting, like you said, the student that was in my class, um, the students who are participating at fairs, at state fairs, um, local horse racing, rodeos, so we definitely want to kind of separate the two and know that there's competitive gambling racing <laughs> and then there's uh, horse racing for smaller events and, and family fun. For it. Yeah. Um, I, I was just reading a little bit after you said the jockey club and yeah, the jockey club was founded in 1750 by some of the most influential figures in British society so it's going to be the wealthy. It's going to be people. Honestly, the people who own the horses probably aren't even the ones racing them. Mm -mm. So it definitely creates that separation of like, like the emotion is being taken away from it. And when it's just a competition for money uh, and it's a competition for the title and like you said, gambling. So I think when you take that emotion away from it, it's that's where the issue comes in. And I think a positive thing about an article like this coming out and something like this being brought to attention is that hopefully there will be changes that come from it. Hopefully there will be regulations of like how hard you can train an animal, how and hard even you can testing the animals for mm -hmm. those illegal drugs or things that people do. Yeah. Like leading up to the event, like you can't participate if your animal is found with any of it. Just like an athlete in human sports. Like if you're found with anything in your blood, you can't participate. Mm -hmm. Or in your pee. Yeah. And like how, I don't know, maybe something about like records showing how they're taking care of them ahead of time. Because like If this animal has, like, such endurance and stuff, like, also they were saying, like, a lot of it was they were failing at the end of the race. So that just shows us that the competitors were pushing them so hard that they, like, pushed them too hard. Too hard in the end. beginning. Mm -hmm. And that the horses were giving, like, they were just their heart and stuff was probably giving up because of how fast they were being pushed. So I just feel like there needs to be more guidelines about like what all of that looks like. And I'm not an expert on that. So I don't know what that would look like or how you would, how you would regulate that. But it's just good that this, um, it's, well, I, they I don't wanted... want a bad light on the sport. They want the no. sport to continue. So that's why they said that, uh, people are like shutting broadcasting off and the ambulance were out there and they were trying to keep it hush hush. But obviously, I mean, that kind of stuff gets out so but they were trying to cover it up as much as possible because they didn't want the public to see it so if they probably after an article like this comes out they probably do want to assure the public like they're doing everything that they can to make this sport safer for animals and for people and just having it be a well organized sport with like you said regulations and uh rules and also it's interesting that they shorten the length of from what it used to be so yeah 1.5 to 1 quarter yeah so are which the maybe horses, that helps yeah but are the horses just develop differently than they used to be like as far as when the genetics do get passed are down, they are running they little... them faster versus longer mm -hmm. yeah um another thing that was in like another thing to put into perspective too is that we're talking about like 
the sport as a whole, you don't want a bad light on it and stuff too. But even talking about money and talking about finances with the horses themselves and how that one stallion they said that could retire and still make millions of dollars just based off of his breeding and genetic line being passed down. The people who own these horses, like, I don't even know if I want to know how much one of these horses cost. Mm -hmm. So the people who buy them and compete with them, they don't want to see them die either. And I know sometimes, like we said, greed and things can get the best of them and they can overtrain them and they can start to kind of push it too far. But they don't want that animal because if they die, then they're out all that money. There's no. Oh, yeah. There's no recuperating that cost because they can't breed it. They can't compete it, compete with it anymore. So, over like it's in, in everyone's best interest to get this figured out, I guess. Mm-hmm. I side note <laughs> while we were talking about this and like researching it, and it just makes me think. Do you know what movie it makes me think of? What. It makes me think of a pretty woman when she's out, like, stomping the the poop back into the ground after the race. <laughs> I actually was thinking about that, too. That's, like, the only really um, connection I have with the Kentucky Derby. They have some horse racing in Des Moines. When I went to a uh, friend's uh, bachelorette party, um, we went down to the horse races for a little bit, and... It was kind of cool. Uh, people were like up in the big stands, like the glass stands with computers, and they were like tracking who was winning and stuff because it was at a uh, casino. And it wasn't, I mean, it was a smaller one. It's in Iowa, but it was kind of cool still watching it, like seeing who would win. And then they get off and take pictures just like famous people do and things like that. It's kind of cool. That's pretty cool. Um, side note speaking of sorry you guys I feel like I'm saying um a lot I just feel like I have like (laughs) lots of different trains of thought like yes like you had a good point and oh I was gonna say this before I forget (laughs) anyways so speaking of like pretty woman and her being at the Kentucky Derby with those like cool hats and like how everyone always kind of dresses up and it's like this thing to do So since the first Kentucky Derby in 1875, it says men and women's fashion has evolved. Women would typically wear corsets with large hoop skirts, a silk dress, gloves, and a bonnet tied beneath the chin during the late 1800s. Um, And outfits are similar today. It's tradition that you continue to wear outfits that represent the wealthy of the Kentucky Derby. Um, let me see here. It says, while pastels are common year to year, there will likely be a lot of attendees in the 2024 Kentucky Derby with the biggest colors. And red is going to be really common this year, I suppose. It says, um, it says gonna- you are encouraged to avoid stilettos, though, and wear wedge sandals because of your heels getting stuck in the sand and door. <laughs> <laughs> It was kind of interesting because I feel like bright colors were kind of the prom, prom colors this year, too. A lot of reds. Yeah. Um, how much does it cost to go to the Kentucky Derby? Um, $130. That's not too bad. Uh, for the general admission ticket. Uh, reserved seating. Can be up to nine hundred seventy five. <laughs> so one hundred thirty general admission, nine hundred seventy five. If you want fancy spots. Well, I feel like we learned a lot about the Kentucky Derby. <laughs> and you guys I'm probably kind of learned some stuff that... you didn't know about it. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of. I mean, I'm kind of surprised that there's not like which there's other breeds of horses that, like you said, that barrel race that, um, are more made for jumping and stuff but i'm kind of surprised that there hasn't been someone maybe there has or maybe it's not allowed that has like tried to compete with a different breed of horse yeah or maybe they just never make it into the kentucky door because it's probably like if only 20 compete then it's probably they have to kind of like a rodeo they have to 
win all of these other smaller races to get into the big one is probably how it works. So yeah, other yeah. horses might compete in the smaller ones. They just don't get to the finish line. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Well, that is our May article um, for this month's podcast. We will try to bring another interesting one to you in June. Um, if you liked this article, please let us know. Comment on any of our posts, share our posts, uh, leave us a review, subscribe, all of those things so that we know that you're taking a listen. Also, so that other people um, hear about our podcasts. So we hope you guys have a great month and we will chat with you in June. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.